Okay, so today we're going to go over uh, the basics of Fourier transforms. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, so the objectives are we're going to look at both 1D and 2D Fourier transforms. Uh, some of you may have seen 1D Detroit Fourier transforms before, um, but 2D is a little less familiar to people. We'll talk about the units that have to be used. And we will also um, look at how to interpret Fourier transforms. And then we'll look at how to work with Fourier transforms and look at some of the basic properties that will be useful for the remainder of the course. So for those of you who are here last time, um, we do look at discrete time signals and um, we also look at continuous time signals. Uh, for today's class, we'll be mostly focusing on sort of continuous time Fourier transforms. Um, later on, when we talk about sampling, uh, we can, uh, we'll, talk a little bit about discrete time Fourier transforms or discrete space Fourier transforms. So just to remind you last time, we spent a lot of time talking about how we represent a signal um, of, uh, in this case, a 1D function. And what we had is it, it, it could be represented as sort of, if you imagine each of these becoming a delta function, it's really just a sum of delta functions. And so we represent signals um, in terms of delta functions. And so delta functions are the basis functions that we use. Fourier transform is different in the sense that uh, imagine you received a signal like this here, and this is maybe sort of a, a signal coming through your radio. And the frequencies are coming from each radio station has a different frequency. So from low frequency to higher frequency to even higher frequency, and there's an amplitude from each one. And so essentially uh, the Fourier transform is simply breaking this rather complicated looking signal into the sum of these three signals. And the Fourier transform in this case, you could interpret as giving you the amplitudes of each one of those sinusoids. So now let's talk a little bit about sort of defining the Fourier transform. So uh, the definition is deceptively simple. In the time domain, we might have uh, the Fourier transform of a function g of t is given by g of f equals the integral of g of t e to the minus j two pi f t dt. And we can also define this as the Fourier transform of g of t. The nice thing is that um, for well-behaved functions, the Fourier transform has an inverse given as such. So it's the integral of g of f. And now we have e to the j two pi f t, but notice that there is not a minus sign there. Um, and so this is the complex conjugate of this phasor. And now we integrate over frequencies, and we can write this as the inverse Fourier transform of G of F. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about coordinates. And so in this class, for the most part, we'll be talking about spatial coordinates. And so X will typically be in centimeters and KX is spatial frequency in cycles per centimeters. And so we might have a function of G of X and we will use K sub X as the spatial frequency. Uh, when we talk about MR, we will have a chance sometime to talk about functions that are a function of time. In that case, T is in seconds and F is in cycles per second or Hertz. And so in this case, we have G of T e to the minus J two pi F T. And so when we're talking about time, it's typically T and F. When we're talking about space, it'll be like X and K sub X. So a really important thing to keep in mind that we're going to use a lot when we talk about MR is Euler's formula. So E to the J theta equals cosine theta plus J sine theta. And so it's useful to, to realize that this is just the repetition of a complex number that has a real part of cosine theta and an imaginary part of sine theta. And we can also describe this as this has by its amplitude or its magnitude and its phase. And so in case, in general, any complex number has uh, z equals x plus jy. And, and typically, just to be sure, in, it's an engineering class. So um, j is equal to, is our imaginary number squared of minus one. And so we always have a magnitude. So we can write any imaginary number as a magnitude times e to the j theta. Um, and e to the j theta has a magnitude of, of one. So now let's look at the 1D Fourier transform. We're going to just sort of split it up into, um, you know, uh, we're going to take this e to the minus j 2 pi kxx term, 
and divide it into a cosine term and a sine term and the J is out here. That's applying Euler's theorem. And so what does this mean? It means that when we're taking the Fourier transform, we're like we're taking our function and we're multiplying it by like this cosine two pi kxx. And so this is really trying to get a sense of how much does our function look like a cosine at this frequency. And similarly, um, this one is looking at how much uh, our function looks like a sine at this frequency. So how much of g of x looks like sine of two pi kxx. Another thing one I want to point out is for every component that has a form cosine two pi kxx, then the period is just one over k sub x. So that's good to keep in mind. Um, and so we need both the cosine and the sine because um, the cosine and sine are offset by 90 degrees. And so for different functions that have different shifts, we need both the cosine and the sine to be able to adequately represent our function. Now, let's talk a little bit about the 2D Fourier transform. So we'll, we'll present the notation and then we'll go into what it looks like in a minute. But here's the notation. So it's, it's basically G and now we have KX and KY for the Fourier transform of GXY. And it's a double integral of GXY and it's e to the minus j two pi kx x plus kyy tx dy. So it's essentially just expanding out. It's sort of uh, adding another integral and and adding x's and kx's and y's to the um, uh, or ky's to the term. We also have a inverse Fourier transform, and so that's gxy equals this double integral of the Fourier transform e to the j two pi kx x plus kyy. And now we're integrating over kx and ky. And so prints and links use u and v instead of kx and ky. Um, but most, a lot of medical imaging uses kx and ky. So that's what we'll use for this course. Okay, so now we wanna develop some intuition about how do you think about Fourier transforms and how do you look at them? Um, so just how do you get beyond the math and start getting a physical understanding of what's going on? So we want to realize that, and, and this is where going into two dimensions requires a little more sort of um, thinking than just doing one dimension. In one dimension, you're just, you just have sinusoids along one dimension. In two dimension, you have to start thinking of plane waves that could be going in either the x direction, the y direction, or any combination of x, y directions. And so we want to look at that. So for example, let's look at this term, e to the j two pi kxx plus ky. As we said before, it can be broken up into a cosine two pi kxx plus ky and a sine of two pi kxx plus ky. So let's look at this, just this cosine term here. Let's assume we get rid of this kyy term. So let's in, in this case, ky would equal zero. Then we're just left with cosine two pi kxx and this, is just gonna be a plane wave that varies along the X direction. So this is the X direction. And it has a spacing between the peaks of that wave of one over KX. Similarly, if we make KX equals zero, then this term goes away. We're just left with cosine two pi KYY. And so this is going to be a plane wave propagating along the Y direction. And it has a spacing one over KY. Now let's say we have in general two pi kxx plus two pi kyy. Now we have variations in both the x direction and the y direction. Okay, so this in general is going to be a plane wave that's propagating at some angle that's diagonal to the x and y. And in this case, the spacing is no longer is now given by the Pythagorean sort of side of we take kx squared plus ky squared and take the square root of that, and that's the spacing now between our, um, our wave peaks. Uh, this is just some math going through it, um, showing that um, if you have kx and ky, so the spacing along the x is still one over kx, the spacing along the y is one over ky, and these, if you do the geometry, then this spacing here is one over kx squared plus ky squared. So that's the period now. The other important point to realize is this term here, that theta equals the arctangent of ky kx. And so essentially, if you know ky and kx, then you always know what that angle theta is in terms of 
um, your variation. Okay, so um, if, are there any questions up now? No? Okay. So let's look at, um, this is from the book and these are different interests. And once again, you know, this would be kx equals one, ky equals zero. So along this row here, we're just looking at all the ky's are equal to zero. So it's only variation along the x direction. And you can see if we go from kx equals one to two to four, we're just increasing the variation and decreased. So the, the, the frequency of variation is increasing as we go from here to here. And likewise, the spacing between these valleys is decreasing. Now down here, we're keeping kx equal to four. Okay, so that's, that's the same across all these. And now we're just varying what ky is from one to two to four. And so if you actually look across here, if you look at the peaks across here, like from here to here to here, that's the same as the spacing of all these peaks in the x direction and the spacing of these peaks or these valleys, okay? So because the kx has stayed constant, we're keeping that spacing the same. But now let's look at what's happening in the, K, the y dimension. So here we're going from here to here, right? That's one repetition, okay? So it's a pretty long period. That's according to ky equals one. Now here that's halved, right? Because we've gone to ky equals two. So now the spacing is much less. And here now it's even less because now ky equals four. So you can sort of see if we keep one spatial frequency the same but change the other, that's gonna just change the angle um, of our plane wave. Okay, so now we're gonna introduce the concept of case space. We're gonna go through a little bit and then we're gonna have you guys do some exercises just to make sure you understand what's going on. Um, so typically, uh, and this will be really important to MR, we're gonna talk about both image space and case space. And so this is also uh, basically, case space is essentially the Fourier transform of image space. And in MR, we're gonna be collecting the data in case space and then transforming it back to image space. But really understanding the interplay between these two is really important for understanding how, is gonna be very important for understanding how the MR process works. So let's get an intuitive understanding of what different parts of case space, what patterns they represent. So this is the axes here are KX and KY. So now let's assume we're at some point here along the KX axis. So here KY equals zero, right? We have some value of KX. And so that's gonna represent a pattern that's only gonna vary in the X direction. If I go further out in K space, I have a larger value of Kx. And so now it's gonna be a higher spatial frequency. And so the spacing of these lines is going to be reduced. Conversely, if I pick a point here in K space, this is now saying at this point, I have this much energy. Um, and so uh, Kx is zero along this axis. So it's only gonna be variations along the Y direction. I have some spacing here. If I go further out in case space, that spacing becomes reduced because I'm not at a higher spatial frequency. So this is sort of telling you what different points in case space, what patterns they correspond to. Now the brightness tells you how much of your image is made up of that spatial pattern. So in this case, uh, the image has quite a lot of energy at this spatial frequency, but considerably less energy at that spatial frequency. And if I think this point here in, cyan, this is going to represent a spatial frequency like that, okay? And in general, a good rule of thumb is if I just give you a point in K space, so let's say Kx, Ky, and I pick out some point in K space at some angle theta, then the spatial variations that correspond to are going to be perpendicular to that line I draw in K space. And you sort of see that's definitely the case, for example, here, right? If I draw that, then that gives me these variations, which is the same as that. Okay. So that's a useful thing to keep in mind as you're trying to think about what different parts in case space represent. Okay, so this is an example of how we make up an image from its Fourier components. And so what you're showing here on this top row is these are the components I'm gonna add in slowly to make up my image. The second row is gonna be sort of the running sum of what I'm adding up or essentially um, as I'm creating image. And then this 
it's hard to see, but this is representing the Fourier transform building up. So you can sort of see, I start with one low frequency spatial component that varies in the X direction. I fall with a component that varies in the Y direction. So I sort of start making this overall shape. Then I start adding this component that starts making it a little more like a head. And I just keep adding in those components. And as I add in more and more components, gradually as I add in enough spatial components with the right amount with, at the right amplitude, I can end up with constructing my head image in this case, all right? So that's the basic intuition of how Fourier transforms help us, help us build up an image. We're building up an image from these different patterns that can vary in all different directions. Later on, when we get to MR, we're gonna talk about how many patterns you actually need, what you actually need to make a good looking image. Today, we're really just focusing on, um, you know, sort of the, the basic concepts that we need, all right? Okay, so this is a nice movie. And what you're gonna see in this movie is on the, on the left is gonna be the Fourier transform. And you're gonna see sort of, we're gonna start adding in more and more components in Fourier space. And on the right is gonna show you what that image looks like as you go through Fourier space, as you gather more and more information in Fourier space, right? Um, uh oh, media not found. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure why that's not playing. Um, so we'll have, to, I'll just have to post that online um, for you to look at. Okay, so let's go through some examples. Um, this is a, so this is an image and this is this Fourier transform. So what I've done here is I've just cleared out, zeroed out all these parts of the Fourier domain, right? And remember parts here along the X axis represent components like this, right? And so let's zoom in on what's going, what's happening on the X axis. So look at this, this is, this part of the brain is your brain stem, sort of at um, the bottom of your brain. And you notice how this edge here is very sharp. Right. If I zoom in on this, this has a very sharp edge here. Okay. So this edge here looks pretty sharp, right? As you're going left to right, that's very sharp. Now, as I go, I get rid of those Fourier components, I've lost the sharpness of that edge going in the X direction. All right. Whereas if you look at this edge here, this edge here going in the Y direction is pretty sharp. And because I've kept that, that information, it's still fairly sharp here, even though I've, because I haven't zeroed out the components along the KY axis. Right. So now we can play a, a slightly different game where here I've zeroed out these components here. Okay. So now I expect those edges as I move along the Y direction to be not as sharp. And in fact, that's what we see. That sharp edge now is blurred. Whereas this edge here is still sharp. In this case, it's reversed because I've kept these components here. So I'm able to represent edges going uh, left to right. And in this image here, I zeroed out all the different components out in K space. And you can notice here, the edges here are blurry in both directions here, all right? So basically this relates to resolution. Clearly this image here has much lower resolution than the, um, uh, the original image. And so the idea is as you just get rid of outer parts of K-space, you're slowly gonna be losing resolution. And this is a concept we're gonna return to um, when we talk about MR. This is the original pair. And in this case, I've zeroed out the center of K-space here. And I've just kept these components. So this means that my image should only really have primarily edges that go in that direction. So if we look at this here, you notice here, I still have edges like this, right? These edges are preserved, but the edges, like these edges here that used to be there are sort of gone because I've gotten rid of that information. Similarly here, I've just kept this part. And so that corresponds to edges that go like that. And so look here, I've maintained this edge here, but I've lost all these edges here. Okay, and so that's, I've only maintained information typically about edges going up and down. Here on this side here, I've retained all the edge information typically. And so now instead of keeping the center of case space, I've kept the outer part of case space. And if you look at this image, it's basically all the edges of your image, 
Okay. So you can start thinking about the outer parts of case space are representing the edges and the inner part of case space is like a low resolution representation or very blurry uh, part. So you have your image is composed of sort of a blurry center part. And then the outer part of case space gives you all the fine detail. Uh, sometimes there might be artifacts in your image. And so here, what we're looking at is this is the Fourier transform, but now what we had before, but now there's a little dot out here. That means there's some energy in Fourier space that wasn't there before. And you remember we said that you can always draw a line from the origin to where you're on case space. And then the, the artifact will be perpendicular to that line. Okay? And in fact, that's what the image looks like. You have your original image and you have these stripes through it. Okay. On the bottom here, we have now this extra energies out here. And so we can play the same game. If we draw a line here and draw the perpendicular, then that means that the, the artifact should be along that diagonal. And in fact, that's what the image looks like. All right. So these examples are just trying to give you a sense of what different parts of Fourier space are and how they contribute to your image. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, give, have you guys sort of do an exercise and let me see if this is set up as a poll. Otherwise, I'm just gonna have you enter it. You're a fairly small group, so you can, we're just going to, um, let's see if I have, oh, polls. I know this will work as a poll, probably not. Okay, well, let me explain what this is. So basically this is a Fourier pair. So A goes with um, zero, I guess. And so now the question is, if you look at these images and feel free to zoom in on this on your local machine, uh, each of these is, a, is an image, okay? And then, um, uh, this is, these are the one, two, and three, okay? So your job is to match uh, each of these top ones with each of these bottom ones, okay? So since it's a small group, if you could go, just go ahead and take a look at that and then enter in your, your answer through the chat, um, just so I get a sense of where people are. This is not, you know, we're not, this is not graded or anything like that. This is just to help me understand where people are. So take a look at this. And so your answer would be like, B goes with, three, you know, C goes with two, D goes with one or something like that, all right? And so you can just write like B1, C2, D3 or something like that. So go ahead, just take a minute to look at that and um, see what you think. So everyone understand what you're supposed to do? Oops, um, let's see what I'm keeping. Sorry, I, I Okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, I think Zavi and Yuan Shan, you've responded, so that's great. Um, so so uh, if we look at these three images on top, you know, um, clearly D has the most information, right? And if we look at which of these has the most information or which has the most information preserved, it's clearly one. So that makes sense. One goes with D, all right? And now if we look at two, this is keeping these four components. So, so we know we're looking for an image that has stripes like this. And here we're looking for an image that has stripes like this. So two would go with D and three would go with C. Uh, so great, looks like you guys got that, okay. So here's another one, uh, same thing, one, two, and three, uh, A, B, and C. So go ahead and take a look at that and see what you think. 
I guess I, I didn't record it. Oh no, I just recorded it. Okay. okay, go ahead and just type in your best guesses so we get a sense of what to discuss. Okay, so it looks like uh, Yuan Chuan, you responded 1C, 2B, 3A. Okay, so let's see. Uh, 1C, 2B, 3A. Okay, so let's look at that. One has information along this one, so it's gonna have edges like that, right? So if we look at what would be corresponding most to edges like that, um, it would be this one, right? This has edges like that. So I think one would probably go with B, okay? And C, has um, edges this way, right? And remember that would correspond to Fourier transform. This, this is gonna have edges like that. So actually two would go with C. And then three has the least amount of information and, and the image in A looks as the worst. So that would go there. So I think, um, yeah, so there, there seem to be, so does anyone have any questions on why that is? So there was a little confusion about which way the edges should go. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. You got that? So, so in this case, why does three have the least information? Uh, are we in the inner case shape or? Yeah, we're the, basically the outer, we're in outer case space. So the center of case space would be here, right? And so this is really just having very little high frequency information. And it doesn't really have, it doesn't really have information along these parts, which would be the stripes up and down, right? And so, that's why this image, as you can see, if you zoom in on this image, right, it really doesn't have any of the edges left, down, right. It's just sort of has some diagonal in, uh, information, but nothing strong up, down, or left to right, because it's only capturing information out here in case space, which is sort of some very weak diagonal components. All right, does that help? Good. All right, great. Yeah, so this is actually really important to, to sort of get the sense of, because if you understand this, it's although it's, once you get it, you get it, but in, until you get it, it's a little confusing. So anytime you spend trying to understand it now, it's just gonna pay off uh, very well. Okay, here's the last one, which is a little more challenging. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to look at this. So now we've got one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D. So please go ahead and take a look at this. And um, if you understand this, then, then that's really going to mean you're, you sort of are in good shape. 
Okay, let's take a look at this. So um, once again, this is a little more challenging. So if there are any questions, please ask them afterwards um, once we've gone through it. Um, so if we look here on the bottom, you know, there's these bars here at different locations. Three of these are sort of at diagonals, right? So we know they're gonna involve some diagonal components. This is purely along the KX axis, right? So we know that this, anything that this adds can only add things going left to right. So if we look at these images here, right? One, this is the only one that has purely left to right variations, okay? And so therefore one must go with B, all right? And then the next thing we can say was, okay, well, which of, which of the other ones sort of looks like this? So the one that looks like that is three. So we might guess that, okay, well, it's probably, it might be this one because this has sort of that, you know, this, it has inherits this additive interference, but it's also off at a diagonal. And the way it's off at a diagonal means that there's gonna be stripes this way. And in fact, if we look at three, it sort of looks like one, but it adds the, it has those diagonal stripes that would correspond to this moving this from here to here. And so therefore we would say three goes with C. Now two and four look very similar, right? And so now it's just the direction of the diagonals. And so in this case, the diagonals are going this way. In this case, the diagonals are going this way, okay? So from that, we can tell that two goes with D because we know that these diagonals have to go like this and we can go a goes with four because those diagonals go like that. All right. So that's how you would sort of go about figuring out a question like that. So any questions on that? This is sort of the last example we're gonna do. And so if you understand the examples we've done, um, then you're, you're in fairly good shape of understanding what things represent in case space. Okay, great. Um, if there's any questions later on, just feel free to ask, but we're gonna move on. And we're going to talk about computing transforms now. So we're going to talk a bit about, you know, how do you get comfortable using this expression of the Fourier transform? So the first thing we're going to do is the easiest Fourier transform, and we're going to start developing a Fourier transform pair similar to what Professor McVeigh did in lecture. We'll just go a little slower probably. Um, so the most important, for, one of the easiest Fourier transforms to remember is that the Fourier transform of a delta function is just equal to one. And that's easy because if you go back to the sifting property, the delta function in any integral just picks out the value of this. In this case, it'll pick up the value of this function at zero, e to the zero is just equal to one. And so that's good to remember. Similarly, if I take a shifted delta function, which is really important because remember, we wanna be able to shift the delta function, then this just picks out the value at when this is x naught. So we have e to the minus j two pi kx x naught. And that's uh, also important to remember. So any shift of delta function is gonna give you a complex phasor. Now, a very, very important one is the Fourier transform of a rec function. Just remember rec function, once again, just looks like this. It's minus a half to a half and it's one. Okay, so it's a very simple function, but we're gonna use it a lot. So it's good to get familiar with it. And very important is what its Fourier transform is. And so the Fourier transform of a rec function, we're just gonna integrate one times this phasor from minus a half to half. So this is an integral that you can do. It's just an integration of a complex of, of an exponential. So you can write it like this. And then it turns out to be sine of pi kx over pi kx. And this is such an important function. We give it a special name. We call it the sinc function, sinc of kx. And so it's useful to know what the properties are. Sinc of kx is basically has zeros at all the integers except for a negative one, okay? It's one has a value of one at zero. And it's basically gonna sort of have these decaying sinusoidal variations. And those, those, those ripples are gonna die off with time, okay? So that's important to remember. Just remember the sinc function is one at the origin. It has zeros at all the integers. And then it just sort of is symmetric and, and ripples off on either side. Okay, now what about e to the minus j two pi kxx. That's a little tricky because um, now we want to uh, evaluate the function at negative infinity plus infinity, but that's really not well-defined. And so it turns out that to do that, you need to sort of uh, apply, do a little more tricky math and see what 
this does underneath an integral. And it turns out that this acts like a delta function. And so actually, if we say the Fourier transform of one is actually equal to the delta function. And so that's our first Fourier transform pair. We had one goes to delta of x, right? And before we had delta x goes to one. So that's a nice sort of thing to remember. So a delta function goes to one and one goes to the delta function. So that's the first Fourier transform pair that uh, is good to remember. Now we can have versions of that. So for example, if I have Fourier transform of a complex exponential, that's gonna be a shifted delta function. And another important thing to remember is if I have a cosine of two pi kx or k naught x, that's gonna give me a delta function half at minus k naught, kx minus k naught, and half at kx plus k naught. And so the way we represent that in Fourier space is if we had kx like this, okay? And this is zero, k naught minus k naught. So I'm gonna half half my energy at k naught and the other half at minus k naught. So now we're introducing this, this concept of both, this is a positive frequency, right? And this is negative. And so this is a question that comes up quite a lot when we're talking about Fourier transforms is why do we have both positive and negative frequencies? Now, when we talk about MR, it's actually gonna be really uh, interesting because we can actually create these positive negative frequencies in the body, in the object. And so they're not, these are not just fictional things. These are real things. These are real positive and negative frequencies. And so it's good to actually start understanding what positive and negative frequencies means uh, such that when we get MR, it makes a little more sense. So this is essentially what it means. Um, so the red, the red arrows are gonna represent E to the, so it's like one half e to the minus j two pi k naught of x. And in this case, k naught is equal to 0 0.5 or, or kx in this case, I guess. Um, and then these are going to represent e one half e to the j two pi k naught. Let's get rid of that extra j. Okay, so uh, the blue is actually the positive frequencies. And so you can sort of, if you look at this blue arrow, there's a blue arrow here. And so the blue arrow, the positive frequency is basically something that increases in phase as we go along the X direction. Okay, so it's having a positive phase as we go in the X direction. Whereas the negative arrow is something that requires negative phase as we go along. Okay, so it's really those two, the fact that which way the phase goes, does it go clockwise or anti-clockwise? And so in this case, the positive is going counterclockwise and the negative phase is going clockwise. Okay, because we define phase as positive in this direction. So this is positive phase, this is negative phase. Okay, so it means a cosine is basically you take two phasers, right, like this, and then they're going in opposite directions, all right? So you see my fingers here. So these are phasers and over time, they're going in opposite directions. And so the sum of them, the imaginary parts cancel out. So you're left with the real part along this axis. And so that's represented here in green. And sort of the green is a summation of the blue and the red. And that gives you this cosine variation where it's big, it gets smaller, changes sign, and then gets bigger. And so that, the value of that is just this cosine function here, all right? So it's useful to think of, to realize that the cosine function is just the sum of these two phasers that are, that are rotating in opposite directions. And one direction, the one that's going counterclockwise is the positive frequency, and the one that's going negative is the negative frequency. Another way of drawing this, and, and this code is, is online, so you can see that, is that if you, and this is the X direction here, okay? And what I've plotted is the real and imaginary part. And so here uh, we're just drawing the real imaginary part. And so one is a surface, you can sort of see this is going, this is going counterclockwise, and then this is going clockwise. Okay, so there's like different screws. One screw is going this way, and the other screw is going the other way. And in this case, if I just look at the summation of these two, if I add these together, right, multiply by a half then the imaginary parts always cancel out. So I'm left with a cosine that's just uh, along as a function of X. Okay. 
right? So that's a useful thing to think about. Uh, another important property is conjugate symmetry, which is if I have g of x defined like this, and I consider the conjugate, complex conjugate of g star of minus kx, it turns out that equals g of kx. And so this means that I have g of kx is equal to the complex conjugate of minus kx. And this happens if g of x is a real function. So that's going to be important. Um, and this is one way we can speed up acquisition of MR later, because if we have, if we know that there's symmetry and we know that the positive frequencies are sort of related to the negative frequencies, then it may be that we can only just acquire some positive frequencies and we don't have to acquire as much data. So what does this mean? Well, this means that the magnitudes are symmetric. So the magnitude of g of kx equals the magnitude of g of minus kx and the phase is anti-symmetric. So if I look at the phase, it's going to be on the positive frequency, it's going to be not negative of the phase of, of the negative frequencies. Uh, and this same thing applies in 2D. So we can have G of kx ky equals complex conjugate of uh, G uh, minus kx minus ky. And once again, the magnitude is symmetric and the phase is anti-symmetric. So let's take a look at an example of this. So uh, this is a question that actually came out in this session last year, was what the Poirier transform of cosine two pi k naught x plus theta. Okay. So you can write this out. You can write this out. You can write that this is just equal to this, right? This is, you remember this from trigonometry, right? Just writing out a cosine. And then we can factor out the ej theta naught and the j theta naught. And then we're left with these terms here. And these have these delta function for our transforms. And so the phase is just, in this case, for the positive frequency, it's theta naught. And for the negative frequency, it's minus theta naught. And so this is once again, an example of conjugate symmetry, okay? And that's shown here where now I've made the phase minus pi over two. And you can sort of see that the, the, the phases are still equal and opposite to each other, but it's just where they sort of cancel out uh, is shifted because we've just shifted the cosine function um, uh, to make a sine function. So now the cosine of two pi kxx plus theta, where theta is minus pi over two, is just this sine function, right? And so the phases are still going in opposite direction, but just where they start off with at zero, they have this phase here is uh, pi over two, and this phase here is minus pi over two. So they just had a phase shift and each of them has been shifted in, in, in the proper way. Okay, another important property is duality. Um, so we looked before, we, we saw that the Fourier transform of e to the j two by x equals delta function of kx minus a. And we also know that the Fourier transform of delta x minus a is just given by this. So this is almost the same, but not quite. So this is a specific case of duality where the Fourier transform, if I know the Fourier transform one way, I can pretty well get the Fourier transform going the other way. Um, so this is a complex exponential went to a delta. So I know a delta has to go to complex exponential and it's gonna be almost the same, except the sign is different. Here it's minus and here it's plus. So the actual, uh, general case duality is the Fourier transform of some function g of x is equal to g of minus kx, okay? So it's essentially you guess, but then you just change the sign of kx and you'll get the right answer. So the most important case of this is this. What's the inverse transform? What's the Fourier transform of sinc of kx? So you could just write it out. You could write sine of pi x over pi x, e to the minus j two pi kx x dx. And you can ask what that equals. And you could probably go back to your calculus and figure this out, but it would probably take you a while to do this, right? I mean, you'd have to sort of figure out which technique of calculus you wanna use and then apply that technique. On the other hand, we can go to duality. We can say, well, we know that the Fourier transform of a rec function goes to sinc. Therefore, the Fourier transform of sinc of x should go to a rec of minus kx, but a rect function is symmetric. So that just means sinc goes to rect. And so that's really nice. So that means that rect goes to sinc 
and sync goes to rect. And so that's another really uh, important Fourier transform pair to keep in mind and also very simple, okay? So rect goes to sync, sync goes to rect. Another important case is separable functions. So in this case, if I can write a separable function g of x, y equals g of x, x and g, y, y, uh, then the Fourier transform is also separable, which means that the Fourier transform is going to be written as g, x, k, x, um, g, y, k, y. And so I just take the two different Fourier transforms and multiply them by each other, and I'm done. So here's an example. If I have g of x, y equals rect of x, rect of y, then that just equals sync, the Fourier transform is just sync kx, sync ky. So this is a very important Fourier transform pair because uh, what does rect x, rect y look like? Well, if I have x and y, that's just gonna be a square where it's one in the square and zero everywhere else, okay? So that's a very useful function for imaging. So it's basically, it basically can capture everything in some window and then everywhere else is zero. So we're gonna come back to this when we're talking about MRI in terms of how much data we wanna collect. So the more data you collect, you just make that rec function bigger. And the less data you collect, you make that rec function smaller. So this is what it looks like. So this is, here is the rec function here. And what we said is the rec function, it's Fourier transform is just two sync functions, a sync kx times sync ky, and that's what it looks like. So I have a sync along kx, which goes like this. And I have a sync along ky, which goes like this. And then multiplying the two together gives me this two-dimensional function, which is defined at both x and y, k, kx and ky uh, locations. Okay, so let's look at example. So the question is, is this function separable? And if so, what is its Fourier transform? So let's work through this example together. So um, is it separable? Well, the first part we'd have to do obviously is to, um, we can write, well, that's exp minus j two pi eight x times sine 28 pi x times exp minus j two pi nine y. So this is just a function of x and this is a function of y. So yeah, it is separable. So we know it's separable, okay? So now let's take the Fourier transform of each part. We're gonna take the Fourier transform of this. And so this is of the form e x p uh, j two pi k naught of x, right? And in this case, k naught equals minus nine. So we know that this is gonna give the delta function ky plus nine, okay? Because that has a value at ky equals minus nine, right? Similarly, now this is the tricky part. You might, you might say, well, I can just sort of, um, you know, take the Fourier transform of this part and this part and multiply them together, but that would be wrong, okay? Because we haven't, we haven't said anything about two things multiplied to each other, which have the same dimension. So these both have dimension X, right? So you actually can't, you actually can't take them for transform of them separately. If you wanted to, you can, well, see there's something called the convolution theorem. But in fact, what you would have to do is you'd have to write this out. You'd have to take E XP minus J two pi eight X and then E to the minus E to the plus J 28 pi x minus e to the minus j 28 pi y, sorry, this is pi x, yeah, over 2j. And then you can combine these, and these are going to be different you know, exponentials, which you can take the Fourier transform of, and that's how you would do that problem, all right? So if there's any questions about this, let me know. There will be homeworks like this sort of in the future when we're getting to MR, just so people uh, we, we make sure that people sort of know how to handle very basic Fourier transforms. Okay, so here's some examples of several functions. Uh, one important several functions is delta of xy equals delta x times delta y. Um, so we can apply separability. This goes to one, and this goes to one, and one times one equals one. So if I have a delta function, 
in X and Y, its Fourier transform is just one everywhere. Okay, so this is just sort of showing that it's one everywhere. Now here's a trickier one, g of x equals delta x. So this is actually delta x times one, okay? So the Fourier transform of this is one, and the Fourier transform of this is delta ky, and that's the Fourier transform. So this is a different function. g of x, y now, if I look at this in function of x and y, this looks like a blade. Right? This is delta of x, right? It's a function of both x, y, but it only has value at x equals zero. And um, sorry, this is this is y and this is x, right? But for all y, it has the same value, okay? And so the Fourier transform of that is delta ky. So if I have ky kx, um, it would, uh, See, so this is x and y, so it, it would also look like this, right? So, um, yeah, sorry, this is delta k, kx. So unfortunately, I've swapped axes there, but that's that's the basic idea. So if I were to draw it better, it would look like this. Uh, let's say this is x and y. So delta x, um, let's see. Let's see, it's the same for all y. Yeah, delta x would look like a blade like this. Right? And then if I keep the kx, ky axis the same, then, um, let's see, does that make sense? Ky, delta x going this way, and then ky. And it says all of the same values for kx. So it would look something like this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So basically these are just blades in K space or in in, or in physical space. Okay, another really important concept is the center of K space. So uh, this is the area under the curve. Um, and so uh, this is an important concept so that center of K space G of zero or G of zero, zero is simply you just take your function and you integrate it over uh, either dx or dx and dy. Another important concept is linearity. So um, you can write any linear function. It's just going to uh, satisfy linearity. So f Fourier transform of a g plus b h is equal to a times the Fourier transform of g plus b times the Fourier transform of h. And you can do that in both 1D or 2D. So these are some examples here where g of x, y equals one plus e to the minus j two pi ax. So this is the Fourier transform of this one plus the Fourier transform of this one. Similarly, one plus this, we're gonna get the Fourier transform of this plus the Fourier transform of this, okay? So you can sort of see this one gives you a delta function. And then this compass exponential, which gives you sort of this pattern here, gives you another delta function shifted off in K space. A uh, really important property is the scaling theorem, which we'll use a lot uh, when we're in the rest of the class. So if I take your function g of ax uh, and I multiply the x by a, that means I'm either making it wider or shorter, sort of wider or narrower. Okay, so that's a scaling. And what that does is it does an inverse scaling kx over a of the Fourier transform and also multiplies it by some constant out here. So let's take a look at an example of this. So in this case, if I have rect of x, that looks like this. This is our rect function from minus a half to half has area of, has size of one. Rect of three x is narrower, right? Because the argument where it has value at three x, its breakpoint is three x equals one half. So x equals one sixth. So it's going to have values. This is going to be one sixth to minus one sixth. Okay. So rect of three x is one third the width of rect of x. We know that rect goes to sink, right? And according to this thing, then this must go to one third sink of kx over three. 
And so kx over sync, let's look at sync of kx over three. For one thing, the height goes from one now to one third, right? Because we've multiplied by one over three. And now let's look at where the zeros are. Okay, remember the first zero of this is at one, right? But if I look at the zero, the first zero is going to be kx three equals one. So that's one kx equals three. And in fact, the first zero of this is at three and there's one at minus three. So now I've taken that sync function and I've I've dilated it by three, and I've also squashed it by a factor of three. So in general, this is really important to remember, anytime you make something narrower in one domain, you're gonna make it broader in the other domain. Conversely, if you make something broader in one domain, you're gonna squish it in the other domain. So this is this is basically the scaling theorem. So anyways, we have all these uh, useful Fourier transform pairs. Um, that um, are useful to keep in mind. Um, so I've written some of them down here. Uh, and the book has some as well. And um, now we're going to go forward and talk a little bit about uh, modulation transfer functions um, and the convolution theorem, which will be the last thing we'll talk about. So are there any questions before we go to the next part of our supplementary session? So covering a lot of material, um, we will review a little bit of this when we talk about MR, but um, if any of this is new to you, just let me know, okay? So in class, um, Professor McVeigh has talked about, so these are like our, our impulse responses, right? So we could have a very narrow impulse response, which means a dot would be fairly well represented. And then as that impulse response broadens, then that means a dot would be become blurrier. Um, it turns out that, the Fourier transfer of impulse response is what's called as a modulation transfer function, okay? And so notice here from the scaling theorem, as this becomes broader, right? This is gonna become narrower, right? I'm, I'm making it wider in one domain, so I'm squishing in the other domain. And that makes sense because this has a lot of high frequency information. So this is a function of spatial frequency. And then as I squish it, then it's gonna have less response and I'm losing information at high spatial frequencies. Um, and so that's that fundamental trade-off we saw from the scaling theorem. Uh, how we measure the modulation transfer function is typically we can get a, a bit of a number of line objects that are different spatial frequencies or a star pattern. And we can see how well our imaging system responds to a pattern like this. So if this was a really bad thing, then as these became closer and closer, then this would become very hard to detect that these lines are apart. Similarly, you can think of putting in different sinusoids. And in this case, as the sinusoid increases frequency, these two bars represent this, the uh, response of the system. And so you can sort of see the response of the system is really going down as I go to higher frequencies. And so for any system we have, that's usually gonna be the case. As I go to higher and higher frequencies, the system won't be able to respond as quickly or as well and then that's, that's gonna really uh, determine our impulse response. So that's what the modulation transfer function looks like. It's decaying as a function of frequency. And so um, why don't we do this one as a poll? So just to make sure, let's just try it out. Okay, so um, for number A, the question is, uh, which of these A, B, or C uh, corresponds to the thing that has the best resolution? So you can go ahead and should be fairly easy to do. Just put in your response. These are different impulse responses. So which one has the best resolution? Okay, good. So uh, I, of the two of you who responded, um, okay, so there is one for, okay, so there's one vote for A and two votes for C. So in general, the best resolution is the narrowest spread function, right? So that would be C. So if you're looking for something that has the narrowest 
has the best spatial resolution, you're always looking for that, which is narrowest. In the ideal case, it's going to be your delta function, which basically has you know infinitesimal narrow. So think about resolution as always in the spatial domain, it's whatever is the narrowest. Okay. So we're going to end that poll. And now we're going to go to the next question. Let's see. Um, now what's going on here? Sorry, just hold on just a minute. I'm going to open up another poll here just in a minute. Okay, so the next question is, um, so let's say we said C corresponds to the base best spatial resolution, right? So now which one of these uh, frequency response curves, one, two, or three, or A, B, or C here, and so corresponds to um, this point spread function? So go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so most of you pick C, um, there's one choice for A. Okay, so let's look at this. So remember from the scaling theorem, as we have something, as we make things narrower in one domain, it must get broader in the other domain. And so C is the narrowest in this domain. So three would be the broadest in the other domain and three corresponds to C. So C would be the correct answer in this case. Um, and that makes sense because remember, um, getting higher and higher frequencies and typically what makes things the most expensive is the more frequencies you can acquire the higher frequency you can go the more expensive your system is in the frequency domain conversely as you try to make things narrow in the image domain that is also very expensive and so that's this fundamental trade-off you're always trying to make things um oops try to get rid of that okay so the final main concept we're going to talk about, uh, which is pretty important, is Fourier transform of convolution. And it turns out that this is an incredibly important concept that we're going to use all throughout the course. So uh, we have about 12 minutes. So I do want to spend some time talking about this. So the fundamental thing is that Fourier transform of G convolved with at H. So this is a convolution. And notice that this, these are both the same x. So this is not x and y. This is x and x. So we have g of x and h of x. So that's, these are not, um, these are two things convolved together. And then this is equal to g of kx, h of kx. And we also have the dual. We have g of x, h of x. If I multiply two things, okay, now notice that these are both x and y. These are both x's, right? So it's not a separable function. It's not x and y. If this was x and this was y, and these we do several functions and we just multiply on this side. These are the same x. And this is, this is important to pay attention to because this is a mistake that is commonly made that people will just apply separability here. But these are not separable functions. This is x and x. As it turns out, the Fourier transform of this is g of kx convolved with h of kx. So what that means is convolution, oops, let's see what happened to my pen. Right. I'm having troubles with my pen. Huh. I'm not really sure why my pen is disconnected here. Um, so anyways, so we'll just keep it to sort of here. So convolution goes to multiplication and so we can get this working again. 
Nope. So, all right, well, we'll just have to proceed without that. So convolution goes to multiplication and multiplication goes to convolution. So here's an example to try to motivate that. Remember, we can take an arbitrary this function and split it into its different Fourier components, right? And this was represented by the amplitude. So we have amplitude of this component is here, this has a bigger amplitude, and this has a very small amplitude. So we can think of any function as breaking it up into its Fourier components. And then we're going to pass it into some linear system, which has some impulse response, right? That impulse response, remember, has a Fourier transform, right? So we can think that it sort of makes sense that this, these components will be multiplied by this impulse response, right? This will be multiplied by this response, this will be multiplied by here, and this will be multiplied by that. So even there, we know that if we put the system into this, we should expect that this Fourier transform gets multiplied by that Fourier transform. So I have y of t equals g12 with h of t. And so you notice that if I go through that system, these components going through the system just get multiplied by the different amplitudes of this modulation transfer function. Okay. So I'm, what I'm left with is that y of f equals just g of f times h of f. And that's essentially the convolution theorem, how to understand that. That basically, we, since anything can be decomposed into these parts, I can take each of these separately, multiply it. And then because of the linear system, um, I can add them all up later. And that's also my output system output of the signal. Um, so this is just uh, sort of mathematically showing why that's the case. And, and so you can look at that um, at your own leisure. And it turns out that um, the important thing, mathematically why this is important is because um, it turns out complex exponentials are eigenfunctions of the convolution operator. And so that's a little, sort of like a deeper um, uh, sort of interpretation, okay? But now I really wanna just sort of in the last uh, eight minutes or so, just sort of show you how you would apply this. So let's look at the application of a convolution theorem. So let's say I have a triangle function that looks like this, minus one to one, and it's a triangle. So I could certainly take the Fourier transform of this. So it's Fourier transform from minus one to one of one minus absolute value of x e to this. And I could certainly calculate this, but it would probably be a bit of work and it would take me a, a bit of time to do that. So what I'd like to do is for things that sort of um, are easy to do by using properties, I'd like to be able to use the property to save time. So it turns out if you remember, from, if you're here at last supplementary section, this triangle function is simply a rec function convolve with a rec function. So, okay, great. I have a function here that's just something, a rec function convolve with a rec function. Well, I know that each of these goes to sync function. And I know that convolution goes to multiplication. So then it turns out that the Fourier transform of a triangle is just sync squared kx. And so without writing anything down, I can just write down the answer by inspection. So I did this in 1D, I can also do it in 2D. Um, and I believe this is probably the last slide, which is a convolution example. So essentially, this is my object here, okay? And this is its impulse response. And if you remember from last time, we said, if I take this and convolve this with this, then this is just gonna be, give me a blurry version of the original object. So this is blurred out. Another way of thinking of convolution you may remember is I can take this impulse response and imagining sort of blurring out every little point of this, and I'm just gonna end up with a set, set of blurred, sum of blurred points, and that's this, okay? So this is convolution here on the bottom. What do I do on the top? Well, on the top, the Fourier transform of this square is just a two-dimensional sync function, okay? And the Fourier transform of this two-dimensional sync function is just a square. And by the convolution theorem, it says, if I'm convolving down here, I need to multiply here. And that's exactly what I do. I take this sync function, I multiply it by this rec function, which only keeps the part of the rec function that's in here. And that's only gonna keep this part. And so I look, I have this, this chopped off sync function and it turns out this chopped off sync function, it's Fourier transform is essentially this on the bottom, which is a blurred version. So convolution here 
is blurring and multiplying by a window in the Fourier transform is just basically getting rid of high frequency components. And as we said before, when I get rid of high frequency components, that's essentially the same as making things lower resolution. All right. So that's really the fundamental sort of picture you want to have in mind for medical imaging, that there's this sort of trade-off and, and this, this sort of um, where if I want to make my image look really sharp, I have to acquire high frequencies. And if I don't acquire those high frequencies, it's going to make my image look more blurry. So you just have that in mind. Uh, that will help you understand a lot of material in the class. Okay. So I think, let's see, we have a few more examples. Shift theorem. Okay. Let me just go through these fairly quickly. Um, uh, one thing you might come across a lot is you might have mo many modules that you hook up together, in which case, the output of the system is just the input convolved with the first module, convolved with the second module, convolved with the third module, okay? And that means that in the Fourier domain, I'm just multiplying these together, okay? So this can give you some insight into how to create your system. So for example, any overall system response, if I have A, B, and C as my module responses, so the overall system response is the A times B times C, so that's always gonna be narrower than the narrowest of them, right? So my overall system response is really dominated by A, okay? So if I have each of these costs the same amount of money, A, B, and C, then what I would wanna do is spend most of my money fixing A because that would have a much bigger effect on making this broader. If I spent all my money fixing C and making this broader, it wouldn't really have much of an effect because A would still be dominating this overall system response. Okay, so understanding this can sort of help give you some insight into how to set up your systems. And finally, modulation is just a, a, an example of the convolution theorem where we're modulating, we're multiplying by either convolute exponentials or cosines. And here, you notice we're multiplying here. So we're just convolving here with a shifted Dirac delta function. Here, since the cosine is two shifted Dirac delta functions, we shift both in the uh, along both positive and negative frequency dimensions. Uh, the most common example of that is AM radio. So I take my function, maybe a speech waveform, I will modulate it up by multiplying by a cosine. So if this is my original Fourier transform. By multiplying it, I just shift it up to these higher frequencies. Okay. So from the point of electrical engineering, I'm taking something that's at low frequencies and modulating it up to these high frequencies where I can more effectively transmit it electromagnetically. Um, and I believe this is the last slide for a modulation example where if I take my object here and I multiply it here by this pattern, then I get this object in the image domain. And in the Fourier domain, it means I have to take this pattern, convolve it with two Dirac delta functions, which you can't really see. And this is gonna give two uh, Dirac delta functions here. Okay, uh, and then these are these two sync functions shifted by the Dirac delta functions as such. Okay, um, and finally the shift theorem is if I take any function and I shift it, it leaves this part and just adds a complex phasor. And that sort of makes sense. Basically, if I take a function and just shift it along, the overall magnitude, which is determined by this GKX, shouldn't really matter too much, but it will add, I have to shift all the frequencies by the right amount. And so this tells me how to shift those frequencies, okay? Okay, so um, those are some of the basic properties. Um, and so I know this is a lot of material to cover. Hopefully it's been reviewed for some of you and, and hopefully some new concepts might be helpful as well. Um, certainly if you have questions, um, we have a few minutes you can ask them now or as we revisit these topics in the class, you can certainly ask that. So are there any other questions before we stop for today? Okay, if there's no questions, I'm gonna stop the recording and thanks for attending and we'll see you in class.